All right, that was pretty good. All right. Um, yes, I came from America, and the story I have to tell you is a true story, and it's not really my story. It's, I wouldn't have a story to tell you if the Lord hadn't acted in a very special way in my life. And as I tell you the story, I only have a wee bit of time, so I'm going to tell it rather quickly. But I want you to reflect, as I tell you my story, on your own lives, because every one of you, if you open yourselves up to the Lord, he will be active in your life. And we open ourselves up to the Lord by having a commitment to the Lord. And we honor that commitment by keeping his commandments, and the laws of the church. We honor that commitment by personal prayer. So we have the prayer of the church, and we have individual prayer. And you must have a real personal relationship with the Lord. It's going to be pretty awful if you get to heaven at the end of your life, and you knock on heaven's gate, and the Lord says, who are you? You know, that'd be pretty bad. So prayer has to be an integral part of your life with the Lord. And I'm going to ask you, before I start to tell my story, to do a little exercise this week. I, I want you to examine how much time do you really give to prayer? And is prayer really important in your life? Because it should be. The Lord's supposed to be your best friend, is he? Um, how much time do you spend with your best friend? Nah. Yeah, huh? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Uh, do a little exercise this week. Take a piece of paper, and at the top of the piece of paper, write 168. That's the number of hours that are in a week. And on the front part of the paper, I want you to honestly keep track of how much time you spend doing your hair, girls putting on your makeup, Guys playing basketball, studying, going to school, talking on the telephone, <laughs> okay? All those good things. And how much time you eat, you spend eating, you know, hanging out and all that stuff, all right? On the other side, I want you to write down how much time you spend reading the Bible, attending church, praying, doing the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Okay, and then I want you to add it all up. How much time do you spend on this corporal body that the Lord has given you as a gift? It's a temple of the Holy Spirit. And how much time do you actually give to the Lord? It might be a little surprising. And then I want you to think about this. Your body will last if the Lord gives you the gift of a long life, 85, 80, maybe by the time you uh, reach my age, I'm, I'm 57, by the time you reach my age, maybe your lifespan will be expanded to 100, 120. Okay? But consider this. Your soul, your soul will last through eternity. So the question is, how much time do I devote to this body, which isn't going to last all that long in comparison with eternity, and how much time am I going to spend on my soul, which is going to live forever? So what I want you to do this week is try and do that little exercise and try and get some of your priorities straight if they're not straight. Okay? Will you do that? Good. All right. It's, it's, for, your own, it's for your own study. It's not to share with your friends. Do it for yourself. And do it for the Lord. Okay? All right. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about myself. And I, yes, I'm going to talk about myself. No, we're not supposed to talk about ourselves, right? But sometimes the Lord gives us stories to tell, and the stories are important. So it's all right to talk. It's all right for me to share this with you because it's what the Lord asked me to do. Um, when I was 15, I entered the convent. Oh. Yeah. I did it because when I was nine years old, I almost drowned. And while I was drowning, I saw a tiny glimpse of heaven. And I tell you, it's some place you want to go. It's some place you really want to go. But anyway, I decided since I really wanted to go to heaven and somebody saved me, they pulled me out of the water. And I really. I really was kind of heartsick inside. 
And that's a horrible thing to say. But after that tiny glimpse of heaven, I knew I wanted to go to heaven. I wanted to be a saint. Now that's asking for a lot, right? So I figured the only way I could be a saint is I had to be a nun. I couldn't be a priest, obviously. And heavens knows I couldn't be married and have you know, children like my mother did because heavens know parents aren't saints. My mother yelled at me. My dad made me weed the garden. My mother made me clean the room and take care of my brothers and sisters. And I had five of them. So heavens, you know, anybody that yells at you cannot be a saint. True? Well, I found out. I learned a lot. I've learned a lot more in my life since I was 15. Thanks be to God. But anyway, uh, I was in the convent for a number of years, from the time I was 15 till I was 28. During that time, I got a terrible disease called multiple sclerosis. It's a disease of the central nervous system, and it turned my life around, believe me. I was one of those real self-sufficient people, you know. I had a lot of talents the Lord had given to me, and I used them all for myself. I really um, thought I was holy, and I really wasn't holy at all. I was a very selfish person. A selfish nun. Can you imagine? Yeah. But anyway, this disease made it so I couldn't take care of my own self sometimes. It would come and it would go. And when it came, it made my life an absolute hell. Everything I took for granted disappeared. One day I couldn't walk. Next day I couldn't even hold a cup in my hand. And then I'd get all right for a while. So in the end, the doctor suggested I leave the convent because they said I needed a lot of rest. And if I didn't get a lot of rest, I was going to get bad real fast. So I came out of the convent after 13 years. And I did have a, a period of respite where I, things were pretty good. I looked kind of normal. I had to wear special shoes and a few things like that. And I got tired real fast, but I wasn't that bad. And during that time, I met a wonderful man. His name is Ron. Ron Klaus, he's here with me tonight, by the way, all the way from America. And he became my husband. And we got married, and I didn't tell him about the MS. And when he asked me why I wore funny shoes, I told him what the doctors had told me to tell in, when I was teaching in Omaha before I came out east to marry him. They said, don't tell anybody you have MS because you won't get health insurance. You won't get life insurance. And because I'd been blind at one time because of the MS, they said, you won't get a driver's license either. Nobody's going to put a, drive, uh, you know, a blind person on the road. So I didn't tell him either. And we got married, and we had three beautiful children. And after the birth of my, our youngest one, Heidi, who is now 18, I had a devastating attack of MS, which left me terribly paralyzed, and from which I never fully recovered. There were no more remissions. The disease spread very rapidly, to the point that I was in a wheelchair, I was in braces, I had operations on my right leg because uh, I had terrible pain in it, and I had contractures, which is a... Uh, real pulling of, of the muscles and everything, everything, uh, everything just went haywire. And in the end, after all the surgeries and everything was over, I was left with a right leg that was totally deformed. And this, was, this is all certified by x-rays and by many doctor certificates. The doctors told me I would never get better. They said that what happened to me was permanent, the damage was permanent, and that it would only get worse. And if the MS went away, I would still be left with all the deformities, which meant that I was partially paralyzed in my arms and my legs. I had no control even my own, over my own bladder, which is horribly embarrassing. You can't imagine how embarrassing that is. You just can't. But anyway, I was a really mess. Just, and the, but the worst thing was I was a mess inside. You know, I thought I was so holy in the convent. Once I left the convent, and once the MS got really bad, I got mad at God. I quit praying. The, I tried bargaining with him. You know, he didn't listen. He just didn't listen. I said, Lord, if you won't touch my hands and the top part of my body, you know, just, just this, the waist down, I can handle this part. You know, I'll be faithful. I'll, I'll be good. I'll, I'll do anything you want. And guess what? A week after I said that prayer, the whole right side of my face became paralyzed. Right down the middle of my tongue, I could feel half my tongue and the other half of my tongue I couldn't feel, my face drooped. I lost almost all the feeling in my right hand, I couldn't lift it any further than this. He didn't listen. 
he really didn't listen. And so I decided since he wasn't listening to me, I wasn't talking to him anymore. No, makes sense, doesn't it? So I tried to do it on my own. And you know what happened? I got so mad inside and so angry. I became the most mean, miserable person. I was mean to my kids. I was mean to my husband. I lost all my friends. Who wants to be around somebody who never smiles, who never laughs, and who gripes all the time? You do, right? <laughs> well, anyway, it wasn't a happy situation. But you know, God is a very loving God, and he always gives us chances more and more and more. He'll, he'll give us chances till the day we die. Because God doesn't just love us, he's in love with us. He doesn't treat us the way we treat him. Isn't that marvelous? He doesn't treat us the way we treat our friends either. He is loving, compassionate, and when he allows bad things to happen in our lives, there's always a reason. There's always a reason, and it's a time for growth for us to shape up and become strong and, and better people, to become saints. But anyway, the Lord had to show this to me in a very, very kind of abrupt way because I really wasn't listening at all. He wasn't listening. I wasn't listening. So I had a friend. I had one friend left. Her name was Mary Ann. And Mary Ann never gave up on me. She never did. She would call me. She'd talk to me. Other people wouldn't. You know, they got sick of me complaining all the time. And one day Mary Ann called and she said, I'd like you to go to a healing mass at a neighboring parish by us. It was St. Ferdinand's. And I was very rude to Mary Ann. And I said, I don't believe in healing. After all, I'm a teacher. I'm a scientist, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Mary Ann didn't give up on me. She called me a couple days later. She said, the mass is going to be next Tuesday. Wouldn't you like to go? And I said, no, Mary, I don't want to go. She said, but people actually get healed at these masses. I said, Mary Ann, healing hasn't happened for 2,000 years, except in the doctor's surgery. That's the only healing I believe in, and I said, they don't have any for me. They're not offering it today for MS. Mary Ann said, you know, Rita, that people, but people are healed. You've seen them on TV. Now that really did it. I'd seen those evangelists on TV and a bigger batch of phonies. My brother was an investigative reporter for CBS for a while, and he uncovered one of these great big shams where they were reeling in people's money and putting plants in the audience that said they were healed, you know. So I wasn't buying any of that either. And she said, oh, Rita, you've seen them on TV. They come up, and they have hands laid on them, and then they fall backwards, slain in the spirit. And I said, Mary Ann, they weren't healed. I said, when they laid hands on those people, they were pushed, and they fell on the floor, and they were too embarrassed to get up. I said, no, I'm not going. Well, my husband happened to be listening in a little bit on the conversation, and he said, why are you so angry at her? And I told him, and he said, you are really a very selfish person. He said, you only think about yourself. What about me? If you won't go and ask to be healed for yourself, why don't you do it for me? Well, I figured I did owe him that much. So I said, all right, I'll go. All right, I'll go. But in my heart, I said, nobody is praying over me. Nobody is touching me. That's it. So Mary Ann said, well, you don't need to worry because the healing part is after the Mass. They'll call all the people up to the front, and then they'll you know, lay hands on them. She said, just don't go up. I said, fine, I won't. When we got to the church, it was packed. There was nobody, there wasn't a space, there wasn't a seat, and the ushers you know, saw me with my crutches and my braces. <gasps> Ooh, there's one, let's get her. You know? And they... <laughs> They practically, one guy on each side of me, they must have been bouncers or something in a bar because they, I mean, they, these guys were big, and I was big. I've never been little. I don't think I was little the day, you know, my mother had me. But anyway, my, my crutches were kind of hitting the, the aisle as they finally came to a place, you know, a pew, and it was already full of people. And the people looked like, well, I've been sitting here for two hours. This is my seat. Nobody's making me move. And then they saw the crutches. Oh, you know. Yeah, we moved down like this. We can all sit like this, you know. So they all got, you know, squished down, and they got me in on the end. I put my crutches on the floor, and as soon as I did, the organ began to play, and everybody stood up. <laughs> and they're all singing, Abba, Abba, Father. And so I go to try to get up, and guess what? They waxed the pew that day. 
And you know, I had these keepers, I had these things on either side of my, on my braces that, so when I stood up, they slid down, they were called keepers or locks. And they would hold my leg like in stiff mode so I could kind of walk like this with my crutches and by swinging my hips. Because I had my right leg was, was really deformed and the right knee looked at my left leg. So I mean, there was no way I could you know, bend this too good. So when I went to pull myself up on the pew, of course my legs were straight out in front of me in this pew and I slid and my feet slid and I started going underneath the pew in front of me. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed. And all of a sudden these people were you know, they're jerking on my coat and somebody else is getting my crutches, and somebody else is lifting me up from the back, and all these people, are, and I was, I was wishing the floor would just you know, swallow me up. I was standing up because I wanted me to notice that I was different, you know? But anyway, they finally got me up, and somebody propped the book in front of my face, and I was, hold, you know, standing there, and everybody's singing, and I'm fuming like a volcano. And I start to look at all these people in this church, and man, I tell you, this church was full. There had to be over a thousand people there. And I began to think, if they're going to lay hands on all these people, we're never going to get out of here. <laughs> and so as the priest came up the aisle to kind of celebrate the Mass, I started counting the priests and dividing it up in my head. Now, how if there's 10 priests and there's a, mil, a thousand people that each have to do 100, and if it takes a minute, it's going to take an hour and a half roughly to bless each of these people before we get out of here. Now, now this is really reverent thoughts. You know, I'm, I'm really a very holy person here now, see. Well, anyway, I got to number nine, and I heard this voice behind me. Wait! As the priests were coming up the aisle, and at the same moment, the priest that was going by me poked the one in front of him, and he turned around, and I felt these two arms go around me from behind. How sneaky. And this priest had me in this bear hug from behind with his arms crossed here. And I'm holding on for dear life so I don't fall over. And in the meantime, all the priests that are coming down the aisle all start coming over. And all the people around me start coming over. And they all got their hands all over me. I don't think there's one part of my anatomy that wasn't touched. And you can imagine the holy thoughts that were going through my mind by this time. <laughs> and everybody is praying. Now, if you never believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, and if I never believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, that was going to be changed in about one flat second. Because as I was, all this was happening to me, and I was getting angrier by the second, all of a sudden an incredible thing happened. And that incredible thing that happened was I was immersed all of a sudden in, in like a bright light. It was in, an interior light, but it was it blocked out everything. Everything I could see, all, all the church around me, all the people. And all I felt was this incredible, incredible peace and incredible love. And it was like I was swimming in it. And I never felt anything so beautiful since the time I had almost drowned when I was nine years old. And I found myself praying the first real prayer I'd said in years. And my prayer was, Dear God, I don't know what you want or what you're doing to me, but whatever you want, you can have it. And I went home from that experience, not healed physically, as you see me today, but I received a healing that was a million times an infinite, 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 wonderful gift more wonderful than any physical healing because I became spiritually healed. I got back the life of my soul. I got back the joy of my salvation. I got back the power to love and to allow myself to be loved. I got back my peace of heart and my purpose in life. And in a word, I got back my God. And I went home and I went to confession and I began to really pray. And people always ask me, wow, especially I hear this from evangelicals all the time, you know, wow, when you were healed, physically healed, how did that really change your life? And I say, no, 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 you got it wrong. It was when I was spiritually healed. In 1981, that's what really changed my life. And with that healing, I could accept what the Lord was doing in my life. I could accept the pain. I could accept the inconvenience. I could accept what was coming down the line, no matter how bad it was, because with God, you can do anything. Without him, everything is impossible. And that's the truth. 
And it didn't matter what my body looked like or how my body felt because I had that peace and I had that knowledge and I had that love of the Lord in me. And with that, God and I were one. God and I are victorious. God and you are victorious. And if you have to lose anything in your life, lose a limb, lose anything, but don't lose the possession of the Trinity in your souls because you will lose your peace of heart and your peace of mind and nothing in the world, nothing in the world justifies the loss of that. You can't live in anxiety and in fear and in misery and in depression. It's impossible to live and be happy. Five years later, I was completely and totally healed spontaneously of the MS. And I'll tell you about that. I don't have much time, but I'll tell you that very quickly what happened. The next five years of my life between 81 and 1986, when the healing, physical healing took place, were for me years of, uh, years of mercy. It was during that time that I cultivated, with the help of the Holy Spirit, a very, very deep personal prayer life. And the sacraments of the church were my mainstay, especially the Eucharist, daily, if possible. And on June 18, 1986, as I was lying in my bed one night, by this time I was in a wheelchair full time, the doctors had told my husband that I had acute progressive spinal MS, which is one of the most serious forms of MS that there are, that there would be no remissions, that all the damage was permanent and irrevocable and would only get worse. But on that night, I heard a beautiful voice, and the voice said, why don't you ask? There was no one in the room. And I was shocked for a moment. And then, being the curious person that I am, I said, what is it I'm supposed to ask for? Because you see, when, when the Lord, at that spiritual healing in 81, when the Lord, I said to the Lord, you can have whatever you want. I couldn't go back to the Lord and say, well, I'm tired of having MS now, take it away. I couldn't do that. I couldn't be you know, a gift giver that you know, turns back. So I never asked for a physical healing. I figured the Lord allowed this in my life for a reason, and when the reason is over, if he wills, he'll remove it. If not, then whatever his will is, that's fine with me. I was given a prayer to say this night. I didn't make it up. I had found, about the, found out about the reported apparitions of our Blessed Mother to six young people in Yugoslavia, a place called Medjugorje. And I've been trying very hard to lead a very good Christian life and doing all the things Blessed Mother asked. Nothing extraordinary. What we've always been told by the church we're to do, to pray, to receive the sacraments worthily and frequently, to read scripture and meditate on scripture, to live a life of Christian charity towards our family members and the members in our communities, and to be a person of faith, to believe when faith seems impossible, but to believe anyway. And the prayer that I was given was this, Dear Mary, my mother, Queen of Peace, whom I believe is appearing at Medjugorje, please ask your son to heal me in any way I need to be healed. I know your son has said that if you have faith and you say to the mountains, move, that they will move. I believe. Please help my unbelief. And as I completed this prayer, I felt this feeling through my whole body. It was like sparkly. It was, it was a beautiful feeling, and I fell asleep. The next morning I woke up, I remembered nothing from the night before, for a very good reason, because the Lord has a reason for everything. I did not remember the prayer. I did not remember the feeling. All I knew is I was late for my scripture course at the university. A school was out for the year, and I was taking a scripture course. And my husband had to help me get into my, my specially equipped car, put my wheelchair on the back. I drove myself to my scripture course. I was late. I had to get Sister Cook to come out from the kitchen, university kitchen, and help me into my wheelchair and help me into class. Class that day was the, it was the, last, the second to the last day of, of the uh, uh, term. It was supposed to be exam day the next day. In the middle of that class, I felt this rush of heat through my body. It was very uncomfortable, and I didn't know what was going on as I sat in my wheelchair. The next thing I knew, it was, I was itching all over. 
In the meantime, as this was happening to me, the priest who was conducting the scripture class was doing the last class and it was on miracles. I completely blocked Father out because this was happening to me and I, you know how it is when you start to daydream and you, oh, hello, where am I? Well, this is where I was. I found out about it later by other catechists who were in the class. Father told them there was no such things as miracles. The miracles were invented in order to make Jesus appear to be divine, to counteract a heresy, where Jesus was assessed to be a human and a prophet only. And he said all the miracles can probably be explained naturally. For instance, when Jesus walked on the water, he walked on the sandbar. And when Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes, he merely got the people to sit down in groups and share their picnic lunches. And when Jesus made clay out of the, uh, out of the, uh, uh, made the uh, spit, mixed spittle and clay and smeared them on the blind man's eyes, there were uh, chemicals in the soil that caused the scales to drop from his eyes. Well, I heard none of this because I, this was happening to me. Well, to make a long story short, I didn't hear him. When class was over, I got myself home. My husband was out picking berries with the girls, so he wasn't there when I got home. And when I went to look at my leg, my right leg, that was so deformed, it was perfectly straight. And I began to scream, my God, my God, my leg is straight, my leg is straight, still not remembering anything from the night before. The Lord had held that from me because he wanted to use me as an example to all those catechists that were in that scripture class, and there were 74 of them in there. The Lord is full of surprises. He doesn't do anything without a reason. I picked my big blue skirt up I had on. I took off my braces. Both my legs were perfectly straight and fine and healthy. And I couldn't believe what was happening. And I grabbed my crutches and I began to walk through the house and I walked normally, normally, even though my legs had been paralyzed and atrophied and deformed. And finally, when I got to the steps that led up to our second floor, I remember putting my hand on the balustrade and as if the Lord said to me, you don't realize the gift I've given you. It's like kind of saying, like, boy, are you dumb? <laughs> At the same time, I was given a vision of my whole life from the time I had almost drowned when I was nine years old up to and including the night before when I heard the voice, the prayer that was given me to say, and the feeling I experienced, and I knew I was totally healed. And I put my crutches in the corner by the front door, and I said, dear God, if I'm healed, I can run up the steps, and I did, all the way to the second floor. There were 13 steps. And then I lost it. I absolutely lost it. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. I raced down the steps and outdoors, and I was screaming, my God, my God, I'm healed, I'm healed. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Blessed Mother. Now, I'm really out of time, so I'm going to make the rest of this fast. But anyway, I, I was in total shock. I ran back inside. The only one who knew I was healed was my dog, who had been following me barking. <laughs> I caught, tried to call my pastor. I rang him and rang him and finally got him and he was, I was screaming at the poor man as I was blowing my nose and laughing and crying. And I was screaming, I'm healed, I'm healed, I don't have a mess anymore. And he kept saying, who is this, who is this? <laughs> and finally he said, is this Rita? And I said, yes, and I can run, I can run, I can run, I don't have a mess anymore. And he kept saying, is there anybody there with you? <laughs> and I said, yes, my dog. <laughs> and he said, I want you to sit down and take some aspirins and you call your doctor. I called my girlfriend because he didn't believe me. I hung up on him, and Marianne, the one who'd taken me to the healing mess, came out. And when she saw me, she couldn't believe it. And there I was. I'd run outside. I'd run through the creek. I'd run across, uh, down through the woods. I had twigs in my hair and little pieces of leaves. And my skirt was still pulled up in my waistband. And here I was, you know, with my, my big long legs hanging out, alcohol splattered with mud. And I was jumping up and down in the middle of, of the floor, you know. And she thought, you know, this woman's gone nuts. And then she realized I had no, no braces, no crutches, no wheelchair, and my legs were straight, and I was perfectly healed. Anyway, she said, you've got to go find Ron and the girls and show them. Show, show, they don't know, do they? And I said, no. And she said, hurry, hurry. So I went and got a, a pair of my daughter's size 6 sandals on and, that, and put my size 10 foot right through. I didn't care. And, <laughs> and on the way up to the strawberry farm where my, my family was picking berries, we had to pass Father's house, so we went in to show Father and ask him for a blessing. I never saw a priest's eyes go like that before, but they did. <laughs> so I got his blessing, we got to the fields, and we missed them, so we went back home. In the meantime, they had returned home, 
and when they saw me, it was absolute chaos. I was jumping up and down. I was even running and skipping backwards. I was doing, I was doing the Irish jig. <laughs> my, my girls, Kristen was uh, 12 at the time, and, and Ellen was uh, 9, and little Heidi was 7. And they were crying, and they were laughing, and we were hugging, and my husband, and Mary Ann, and little Heidi just kept standing there. <laughs> and finally she said, Mommy, 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 don't act like this. Mommies aren't supposed to act like this. <laughs> and I said, you don't understand, honey. Jesus healed me through his holy mother. I don't have MS anymore. And she said, oh, good. Now I don't have to do any more work. <laughs> but God is very good. And God uses... There's a reason for everything in our lives, all right? I wouldn't be able to do what I do now if the Lord hadn't prepared me by putting me in that convent for 13 years where I was grounded in theology and in scripture and in counseling. Now I go and I give retreats and I talk to groups like you and I witness to the Lord for his goodness in my life. And you, each one of you, by your baptism, you are called to witness the Lord in your lives. By the way, you live by the way you proclaim the goodness of God and salvation, by the way you conduct yourselves in front of your peers, by the way you, yourselves, communicate with the God who loves you and not only loves you but is in love with you. You proclaim God in all aspects of your life when you live your commitment your commitment to your baptismal promises and your confirmation promises. And when you're fed by the Eucharist and you receive that sacrament of forgiveness, which makes you whole and complete, no matter how many times you fail, God's forgiveness is infinite. So let us praise God. Let us thank him for his many gifts to us. And count your blessings in your own life. And as you start to contemplate what you're going to do with these beautiful lives the Lord has gifted you with, Remember that every talent and every gift you have comes from God. It's not for your own personal use, your own personal glory. It's for the building of the body of Christ.